Welcome, everyone. Very, very pleased to, uh, to welcome you all to the David Lipson Memorial Lecture. We are very privileged to have Dr. Adrian Crone from Allegheny College come up and talk to us about Jewish community farming and the climate crisis. Adrian Crone is an assistant professor of environmental science and sustainability and religious studies at Allegheny College, so a PhD in American religion from Duke University, and her research focuses on religious food justice movements in North America. Her current research project is an ethnographic and historical study of the Jewish community farming movement. So, uh, and I suppose I should probably also say hi to everyone. I'm Tanhumi Aray, I'm a professor at the uh, at the School of the Environment and also a member of the Antennebaum Center for Jewish Studies. And um, it's, it's just great to, uh, to be here gathering on, on, uh, around this topic. And uh, you know, I'd like to thank the, the Antennebaum Center for, uh, Center for Jewish Studies for seeing it fits to bring this area into the spotlight for at least a, a moment. And hopefully we can work on uh, sustaining that spotlight as we, we move through the, uh, the next years. Uh, you might be asking yourselves, well, Jews and, and farming, well, you know, perhaps you know, in ancient Israel, and maybe again in the modern state of Israel, but Jewish community farming in North America, that seems like a bit of an odd thing perhaps to some of you. And we're not talking about here just about Jews who are engaged in farming. We're talking about Jewish community farming, which is a, an interesting distinction that uh, Adrian will be talking about as, as uh, the afternoon goes on. Um, but yes, Jewish community farming, specifically people who are coming together as community in order to build community, intentional community, uh, and focus on building Jewish identity around some really, really important topics like social justice and climate change and, uh, and food justice and food security and a slew of other things that we'll probably be hearing about uh, shortly. Um, and these are really, really timely things and, and uh, we're, we're quite privileged to have someone who's been in the field studying this movement for quite a few years already and, is in fact one of the pioneers. So uh, without further ado, please uh, join me in warmly welcoming Adrian Pro. Thank you for that wonderful welcome. Thank you all for coming um, in person and remotely. I'm honored to be here um, and we will dive in. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, now we're set. <laughs> Thank you. Oops, still not advancing. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Make sure we get all our technical things working. Okay. So July 4th, 2015 fell on Shabbat. At Adama, the Jewish Environmental Fellowship at the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center, the fellows spent the day taking leisurely walks and trips into town instead of their usual activities, which include things like chores, working in the fields, and taking classes. As the sun started to set, I joined two of the fellows on a hike up to Lookout Point, an overlook that sits on the Appalachian Trail adjacent to the retreat center. When we reached the peak, the sun was setting, so we decided to start Havdalah, the traditional ceremony to end Shabbat. We brought a candle with us, but we had to get creative to come up with the other Havdalah supplies. Scented oils took the place of a spice box and we used water instead of wine. And as the first fireworks started to light up the horizon below us celebrating Independence Day in the US, 
we sang the blessings together to welcome in the, the week after Shabbat. As we were finishing, more fellows, staff, and visitors from the Isabella Friedman Retreat Center joined us and kept the singing going. And instead of the usual cacophony of fireworks, our ears were treated to a choir of about 20 voices singing in harmony as we watched the colorful displays below us. When the fireworks ended, we hiked down the mountain by the light of our headlamps and spent the rest of the evening enjoying kosher hot dogs and veggie burgers around a campfire. This July 4th celebration epitomizes Jewish life at Adama. We enjoyed a creative celebration that was earth-based, Jewish, and American. We hiked up a mountain, performed an improvised version of the Havdalah ceremony, and enjoyed the standard July 4th fireworks. Celebrations like this occur with increasing frequency as the Jewish community farming movement expands. So the Jewish community farming movement, um, which began with kind of officially, unofficially with the founding of Adama in 2004, now consists of about 20 innovative and pluralistic Jewish community farming organizations throughout North America, including Shoris Jewish environmental programs here in Toronto. I've been studying these farms since 2012, and I have now visited and conducted interviews at about 25 sites. We'll talk about this, but some of them kind of come and go. <laughs> um, so there end up being around 20 at any given time. The Jewish community farming is, uh, sorry, the Jewish community farming movement is, to use a bit, a term a bit too on point, a grassroots effort. Each farming organization was created to address the specific goals and needs of a defined community. These organizations are then joined by a dual focus on the environment and food justice in response to environmental degradation and climate change. But they have developed methods, models, and goals independently. And as a result, they vary widely. Some organizations have small plots of land, others have hundreds of acres, and some own no land at all. The farms are located in urban, suburban, and rural spaces across the United States and in Canada. There are farms at camps, synagogues, JCCs, Jewish day schools, private homes, retreat centers, and there's even one at an envelope factory. Some of the organizations prioritize food security, getting food to people in need in their food justice work, while others prioritize food sovereignty, working on systems change so that people in need have autonomy over their food production and choices. A few organizations include in their mission a focus on one specific issue, like racial justice, inclusion of differently abled participants, ecological restoration, or expanding the role of Yiddish in American Jewish life. Farmers, educators, administrators, and program participants at these organizations represent a multitude of Jewish and non-Jewish identities. And so I'll offer a glimpse into a number of these different farms throughout my talk this afternoon. When I described this research project to student and to students, um, and Professor Uray was talking about this, um, as well as colleagues and friends, the common response is a giggle and some form of the question, Jews farm. This is a response that speaks to a real and perceived distance between most modern Jews and their agrarian ancestors. Once I've convinced somebody that Jewish farmers exist, the next question is usually, well, what makes a farm Jewish? It surprises many Jews and non-Jews to learn that agriculture is inherent to Judaism. These Jewish community farming organizations are working to educate people about a Jewish agricultural past while ensuring that there's also an agricultural Jewish present and future. I'll begin by discussing some of these agricultural foundations of Judaism that the Jewish community farming movement uses as a basis in the work that they do, mostly in educational programming. And then I'll discuss some of the sustainable and spiritual practices on the farms. It's been hundreds of years since the majority of Jewish people worked in agriculture. Darren Jaffe, who worked as the founding director of agricultural innovation and development at the Leishtag Foundation until a few years ago, um, who goes by the name Farmer D and not um, Darren Jaffe, <laughs> um, sees this disconnection as something that can and should be rectified. 
As we sat in his office, he reflected on this and said, as Jewish people, we've been pushed off the land through diaspora. We've lost touch. Farmer D sees Jewish community farming as the path back. He explained that engaging in farming could move Jews towards reclaiming their cultural identity and connection to the earth and seasons and social justice and stewardship. So the Leash Tag Foundation, um, which is overlooking the ocean um, in Encinitas, California, dedicated an initial 67 and a half acres to a farm. Um, it's now an independent organization called Coastal Roots Farm. And this community farm is inspired by this ancient tradition of Jewish agriculture. The Jewish community farming movement organizations are bound by similar commitments to engage Jews in non-denominational settings to reconnect them to Judaism, the earth, and its creatures through this revitalization of Jewish agricultural laws and traditions. So this afternoon, we're gonna talk through some of what that looks like. Um, we'll begin with the Jewish agricultural laws. So Farmer D again um, has a solution to reconnect the Jews to the land. And he explained the guidebook back in many ways is the Jewish farmer's almanac in the Torah like how we farm and how we care for animals and for people. So the Torah, which is also known as the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament in different communities, um, describes the communal narrative of the Jewish people and it assumes an agricultural setting. The creation narrative in Genesis describes how the earth was created and how and when everything on it came to be. There's much debate both in and outside of Judaism over whether humans were meant to have dominion over the creatures of the earth or act as stewards for them. But either interpretation calls for humans to be intentional about their relationship with land, plants, and animals. In the third chapter of Genesis, Adam and Eve are banished from the Garden of Eden and Adam's punishment is to toil and sweat in order to eat. Narratives like this story of Adam and Eve offer an explanation about the lives that ancient Israelites were living. Biblical Israelites knew it was useful to keep domesticated animals, and also that growing food was difficult and unpredictable. The almanac portions of the Hebrew Bible that Jaffe mentioned offer guidelines for Jewish agriculture. There are laws about how to grow food and when to harvest it. The Hebrew Bible also offered some troubleshooting for times when animals were inflicted with disease or the rains didn't come. The question that the Hebrew Bible answers isn't whether humans should engage in agriculture, but rather how humans and Jews in particular should engage in agriculture. Because of this, the Jewish agricultural laws were a priority when the first generation of rabbis compiled the Mishnah, their commentary on the Hebrew Bible. The obligations of farmers were addressed in the very first volume of the Mishnah called Zeraim or seeds, because farming was the primary occupation of the Jewish people in the early centuries of the common era. Five of the 11 tractates or sections of Zeraim deal specifically with farming and food, while others are concerned with blessings, donations to the temple, and tithing. The tractate Peya, which means corner, is concerned with regulations based on Leviticus 23.22, which commands Jews to leave the corner of one's field for the poor. Kilaim, which means of two sorts, deals with the rules of relation uh, the rules related to forbidden mixtures. Um, laws discussed in this tractate forbid Jews from planting two kinds of seeds together and breeding between different types of animals. And this is an interesting thing that we might talk about in Q&A because um, planting things separately is not necessarily good ecological practice. Um, but here's some images of Peya gardens at different Jewish farms. Another set of laws is called Orla, which translates as uncircumcised and is about the waiting period that must be observed before the fruit from trees can be consumed. This is based on Leviticus 19, 23 through 25, which informs Jews that after a tree is planted, the fruit is forbidden for the first three years. In the fourth year, it should be offered to God. 
and then they may begin eating the fruits in the fifth year. The first fruits um, to come from the trees, the first products of all these harvests are also meant for God. This is the topic of another section called Bikurim, which means first fruits. Shavi'it, another section, um, which means seventh year, describes the restrictions of the agricultural sabbatical year known as Shemitah, which means release. This practice offers a Sabbath for the land. So just as humans are commanded in the Hebrew Bible to rest after six days of work, they are commanded to let their land rest after six years of being worked. All forms of agricultural labor were forbidden in the seventh year, including plowing, seeding, reaping, and harvesting. Jews were permitted to eat perennial crops and to ensure that their animals and people who didn't have access to land were also fed during those years. The Shemitah year also includes an economic component, which calls for Jews to release debts. And last year, um, was a Shemitah year. So it began on Rosh Hashanah back in September, 2021 and ended recently on Rosh Hashanah in September of 2022. So the next Shemitah year won't be for many years. <laughs> We're in the middle times. Um, but these kinds of guidelines set up an agricultural ethic for the Jewish people that's based on an idea that Jews are meant to live as one creature among many in a world they didn't create. These laws encourage Jewish farmers to give their trees time to grow before they begin to harvest, and the best of their harvest is marked as sacred and offered to God. Forgetting, forbidding the mixing of crops and animals calls on Jews to be conscious of their power and wary of abusing it. And setting aside the corners of one's field for the poor reminds Jews that the food they grow is meant to feed not just their own family, but their entire community. Finally, the sabbatical year reminds Jews that the land does not belong to them and that it deserves rest as much as humans do. So as North American Jews at these Jewish community farming organizations are returning to the land and um, seeking to revitalize these ancient practices, their enthusiasm for the ethical approach to agriculture that they see in some of these laws and their desire to reconnect Jews to their roots in every sense of the word has resulted in a creative reimagination of these laws. So we'll talk about some of the agricultural holidays now. Um, agriculture also provides the scaffolding for organizing time and building a meaningful Jewish life. The Hebrew calendar is organized by growing seasons and pilgrimage festivals. Um, with four different new years that marked key moments in the annual agricultural cycle. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish new year most familiar to people. Um, this is the new year of seasons. It occurs in the late summer or early fall, and it marks the point at which the Hebrew year changes. Um, the seven year Shemitah cycle is counted, as I mentioned, using Rosh Hashanah. Tu B'Shvat, which is coming up in a couple weeks, is the new year for trees. Um, this holiday celebrates the end of winter and the first buds of spring. Um, note that that is tied to a particular place um, in the world. That does usually not mark the beginning of spring here in North America, um, or at least our parts of North America. Um, but this year, new year of trees is also used to keep track of the age of trees for Orla. So if you want to know how old your tree is, that's the tree's birthday. Um, the new year for the Jewish people falls on the first of Nisan, which is the spring month that contains Passover. Um, the months actually start over in Nisan. So Nisan is the first month of the year, which doesn't line up when the year changes, which is a little bit different than Western calendar systems. Um, this new year commemorates the transitional moment when the Jewish people left Egypt and became the nation of Israel. The final new year is the new year for animals, which falls in the late summer. This was the date used to keep track of the age of one's cattle, the size of one's herd, um, and especially during the, the period of sacrifice where people were bringing animals to the temple in Jerusalem, um, this helped them keep track of what they needed to bring to the temple to tithe and offer to God. Three pilgrimage festivals also punctuate Jewish time, um, and in each of these festivals actually began as an agricultural festival that was later imbued with historical significance when people stopped having to bring their, their harvest to the temple because the temple no longer existed. 
So Passover marked the beginning of a new planting season in ancient Israel um, and later, as we know, became associated with the exodus of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt. Shavuot, which fall, uh, falls seven weeks after Passover, was an agricultural celebration of the spring harvest. Um, often barley was the primary uh, offering at that point. And after the biblical period, that holiday took on significance um, to commemorate the day that Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai, according to Jewish tradition. Sukkot was the celebration of the fall harvest, and over time, it also began to recall the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the desert after the exodus. So as Jews moved off the land and away from agriculture, the agricultural foundations of these holidays were often diminished in favor of these historically significant meanings. The Jewish community farming movement and Jewish environmentalism, a little bit more broadly speaking, does tend to uh, have a goal of reconnecting Jews to this rhythm of seasons that is ingrained in this annual cycle of holidays. The contemporary Jewish farms um, offer agricultural spaces where Jewish holidays can be celebrated in nature in accordance with their original intention. So this is a sukkah um, that people gather in during Sukkot from Abundance Farm in Northampton, Massachusetts. And it sits right in the center of their um, one acre farming space. The Jewish farmers reimagine and revitalize these ancient agricultural practices and holidays. And as they do so, they begin to alter their relationships with animals, with the land, and often with each other. So we'll head now to the farms to witness some of the reparative work that these Jewish farmers are doing. And we won't go very far, we'll stay here um, in and around Toronto. Um, so human animal relations, um, that form the center of work at these farms encourages Jews to rethink their relationships with animals and with the foods that they produce, in addition to their responsibility as Jews to protect and preserve vulnerable animal populations. We're going to talk about staff at Adama in Connecticut and also at Shores Jewish Environmental Programs here in Toronto that engage chickens, bees, eggs, and honey in their Jewish rituals. When they do so, they are also including these animals and their products in their religious community. Um, so this is from late June of 2015, um, a moment in time when hundreds of people gathered in Erin, Ontario for the grand opening of Bela Farm, which is a collaboration between Jewish, uh, Shoresh Jewish Environmental Programs and a number of other uh, nonprofit organizations. Maybe some of you were there also. I actually know some of you were there also. Um, we gathered in their outdoor synagogue space for an opening song and opening words from Risa Allison Cooper, who was the executive director of Shorish at the time. During her opening remarks, Risa explained that at Bela Farm, they are manifesting a 114 acre center for sustainable land-based Judaism. After her remarks and some more singing, we marched out into the land led by a band singing as we marched and you can see that here. We walked by beds of garlic and soon entered a protected forest area. There the band stopped playing so we could walk quietly through the apiary where the Bela beehives lived at the time. We headed past nine hives accompanied by the quiet hum of thousands of bees buzzing away as they went about their work. Protecting pollinators has become a priority for Shoresh. Sabrina, who's their director of engagement, picked up an interest in beekeeping when she was a fellow at Adama in Connecticut and brought it back with her here to Toronto, where she began to learn from a local master beekeeper. She focused on pollinator protection in urban centers in her graduate work in environmental studies, and she combines her knowledge and her passion in her work at Shoresh. Concerned about the declining local pollinator population, Malik wanted to do what she could to include bees in the mission of Shoresh. In a Toronto Star article titled, Ring in a Sweet, Jewish, a Sweet Rosh Hashanah with Jewish Honey from 2014, she described the process by which Jews in Toronto came to care about the bees. She said, they fell in love with the honey, but when they hear about bees dying, it made people care. The bees at Shoresh are Apis mellifera, also known as European honeybees. 
This species of bees pollinates more than one third of global produce. Most grains do not rely on insect pollination, but many fruits, nuts, spices, and vegetables require cross-pollination. And alfalfa, which is one of the main sources of livestock forage, is also pollinator dependent. So meat production similarly requires pollinator participation. Since 2006, beekeepers in the US, Canada, and Europe have dealt with colony collapse disorder, which is known as CCD. In the US, beekeepers face an annual honeybee mortality rate averaging 30% due to CCD. So restoring honeybees and native pollinator populations are a priority for Shoresh, um, and they are using the land at Bela Farm to do that. Not all of the land, a lot of the land is being used for other things. Um, Shoresh refers to this work as community supported beekeeping. And they ensure that the community, the Jewish community here in Toronto has plenty of opportunities to learn about bees, colony collapse disorder, and other local pollinators. Every garden that Shoresh runs around the city has a section of plants to support wild pollinators. And at Bela Farm, they've dedicated about 20 acres of the land to wildflowers and other pollinator-friendly plants. So back at that grand opening celebration, um, after we marched past the highs, we walked into an area called Dina's Tent, um, which was a gathering place in the middle uh, of a field surrounded by 12 permaculture guilds that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And the land has changed a lot since then, but this is what it looked like back in 2015. A performance group recited a poem about nature as seed balls, which you can see here, were passed out. Risa led the crowd in a blessing of thanks for reaching the moment. And then we walked in silence to a fence at the edge of the field and threw out the seed balls into the land that Shoresh had just acquired. The seed balls flying over the fence into the land were the first of many wildflowers that have since been planted in the Bela Farm Bee Sanctuary. All the seed balls out began to dance. So just as Shoresh centered a lot of their works on bees, at Adama, chickens actually form the heart of their farming operation. I learned this um, over many visits, but especially when I was there on a very cold morning in December of 2015. And this is an image from a warmer day when I could take my hand out of gloves to take a picture, <laughs> um, but it's the same ritual that I will describe. So, I don't usually pray outside in the morning um, in a compost yard in 20 degree weather, but there I was at 7 a.m. I was attending the Hazon Jewish Food Conference and Sarah Chandler, who was then the Chief Compassion Officer for the Jewish Initiative for Animals and the former Director of Earth-Based Spirituality at Adama, led the group through Shahri, which is the morning prayers um, in Judaism with the chickens that live there. So on that cold December morning, we sang as Sarah opened the doors to the roost, which you can see here, and the chickens scurried out to start their day. As they did, Sarah walked us through the morning prayers, and then she asked us to choose a chicken and enter into meditation with that one chicken. We were meant to walk alongside the chicken um, and try to see the world as the chicken was seeing it. So I picked a small but feisty rooster I followed him through the yard as he crowed at hens. I watched him nibble on some orange peels and reject a compostable cup. I saw him scuttle away when a more dominant rooster crowed loudly in his direction. And I wondered whether his feet were cold walking through the snow and marveled at the tiny little footprints he left as he scampered about. After a few minutes, Sarah called us back and asked us to reflect on our time with the chickens. Some people shared their observations and others members of the group began to remark on how we had witnessed some similar behaviors and some that seemed characteristic instead of individual birds in the yard. Sarah then fielded questions about chickens. She told us that at that point in 2015, Adama was in the process of transitioning their flock to heritage breed birds, which is a transition that was completed. Um, with the help of a local chicken farm called Link of Legal, which is Yiddish for left flank. 
In the United States, um, heritage chickens began to be replaced by hybrid breed chickens in the 1950s because the hybrid chickens grow faster and bigger with less feed. They are also more likely to experience issues with skeletal development, heart and lung function, and obesity. Um, so Adama's chickens being as integral as they are to the farm, they help process the compost, they loan eggs and other products um, to the kitchens, including eventually themselves. Um, the hope is that th when they transition to heritage birds, that those birds, um, which they have, would live longer and healthier lives. So every day, about 100 pounds of food scraps are added to a growing pile um, in the compost yard marked Feed Me, and the chickens get busy. They pick through the food scraps from the retreat center center's dining hall. They kick up the dirt and the food that's in varying stages of decay, and they defecate on the pile. Their work, plus time, results in dark and nutrient-rich compost that Adama then uses to grow crops for their dining hall and for their community-supported agriculture or CSA program. Bringing people into the compost yard to engage with the chickens allows guests of the retreat center to think differently about chickens and to learn more about animal welfare as it relates to the chickens. Face-to-face -face experiences like the one we had on that cold morning and also on the warmer morning are meant to deeper the relationships between Jews and chickens and to encourage Jews to be conscious of the current welfare issues in poultry farming. So the staff at these two Jewish farms are educating their communities, creating opportunities for Jews to encounter animals, and they're engaging in multi-species Jewish ritual. Adama and Bela Farm serve as sanctuaries and sacred space for Jews, for bees, for birds, for humans that all dwell there together. And just as Adama and Shorish are focused on repairing relationships with animals, other Jewish farms are focused on repairing relationships with the land and with plants. So on a sunny day in June 2015, you're starting to be able to tell when I had funding to do field work um, from when a lot of this happened. Um, the farm of uh, the Pearlstone Retreat Center in Reisterstown, Maryland was relatively quiet. A small group of volunteers was harvesting the last of the asparagus, while another group was breaking down the old wooden structures from the greenhouse beds. One of the staff people was cutting the lawn at the edges of the farm, and I was sitting in a patch of chamomile harvesting the flowers, which you can see here. Eventually, the chamomile was to be dried and given to the program staff so they could use it in goat milk soap demonstrations. It was a calm task and one that contrasted drastically with work that I had done when I visited the farm two years earlier. During that summer in 2013, I had worked with a group of farm apprentices, planting, watering, weeding, pruning, hoeing, and harvesting produce for the community supported agriculture program. But in 2015, the four acres of land that were usually dedicated to raising vegetables and herbs for the CSA were in the midst of their year of release. The apprenticeship program was suspended for the year, but the fields were not barren. The usual rows of squash, peppers, and tomatoes were absent, but the fields still abounded with vegetation. Buckwheat, barley, and oats were planted to rejuvenate and nurture the soil. These cover crops were preventing soil erosion and adding nitrogen to the earth. Worms were moving through, leaving nutrient-rich uh, castings as they went and networks of mycorrhizal fungi were reconnecting all the areas of the farm and fostering communication underground. As I stood overlooking the farm with farm director Greg, I marveled at how the farm was simultaneously the same, but also completely different from my previous visit. And so you can see in these images on the left is 2013 when the farm was in production and you can tell it's different crops and some of it has insect uh, protecting uh, cloth on it. And on the right is 2015 with the cover crops. So Greg concurred and he suggested that what we were looking at was just one degree different than we would be looking at in any other year. It was 99% the same, but the 1% difference was the Shemitah ingredient, which Greg said was their aspiration right then. 
He estimated that 90% of the garden spaces on the farm were healing during that Shemitah year in an effort to achieve a maximum restoration that would ensure the success of the farm in future years. Healthy soil has a lot to do with the success or failure of food production. And so Shemitah and the cover cropping that came with it were allowing their soil to rest and rebuild. As the soil rested, the staff turned to restoration projects around the property. This suited them well, because as one staff member put it, farmers don't rest. Told that very, very explicitly. <laughs> um, so Shelby, who is a Chesapeake Conservation Corps volunteer, um, who was assigned to Pearlstone during that Shemitah year, explained that her work on the farm was divided into 20% educational programs, 30% on the farm, and 50% ecological restoration, which she said actually most interested her. Um, she had done two major projects as part of her work on restoration. The first was restoring the riparian zone, which was a wooded streamside area at the boundary between the farm and the woods. We worked in the riparian zone on a particularly hot day during my visit. Shelby and a group of volunteers from the AmeriCorps program um, who were assigned to Pearlstone for the week, plus myself, worked the entire day to clear out invasive species in the area. So this task included pruning thistles, removing honeysuckle that had overrun a hillside area, cutting back invasive vines from indigenous trees that were planted in the zone, and keeping an eye on the spread of a parasitic species that Shelby had tentatively identified as Japanese daughter. At the end of the day, we were all scratched up, sunburned, and exhausted. A number of the volunteers reported back the next morning sporting red inflamed poison ivy rashes, but I heard very few complaints. A few minutes spent with Shelby was enough to convince us that battling invasive species is important work. She said she feels that these plants are an ecological danger that people aren't paying enough attention to. The invasive species tend to outcompete native plants, which throws off the balance of local ecology. This is work that is vital to the ecological restoration of the land at Pearlstone. This is also work that the farm staff had not had time to do during their CSA years when their days were spent caring for annual crops. The Shemitah year provided an opportunity for Pearlstone to repair some of the damage they had done to their fields, as well as damage that had been done prior to their arrival in the surrounding wooded areas. The staff at Pearlstone released their land for the year and reset their priorities and dedication to creating physical and mental space for Jewish agricultural, ultra, agricultural work in Baltimore. And then the final area where many of the Jewish farms focus their attention is on moving towards justice for all people, both in and outside the Jewish community. So there are two organizations that provide particularly good examples of how this justice work develops in different contexts, as well as the transient nature of these projects. Netia was a Jewish network that operated for a few years in Los Angeles County, California. And they installed gardens for synagogues, churches, and mosques, and focused on food justice projects. Also in California, the staff at Shemesh Organic Farm at the Shalom Institute in Malibu centered inclusion in their work, even when their work was disrupted by wildfires. So we'll start in LA. Um, on a hot morning, it's always hot when I do these visits. Um, on a hot morning in July, I stood in a circle of Jewish teenagers from the Mitzvah Corps program, um, Jewish community volunteers from all over LA, and members of the Emanuel Turner African Methodist Episcopal Church in that church's satellite parking lot in Compton to start building a garden. We were welcomed by Anthony from the church who told us he never gets emotional as he began to tear up at the sight of so many people ready to work on turning his dream into a reality. Anthony had applied for a matching micro grant from Netia. These grants, which were offered to community members in food deserts, um, often called food apartheid because of an intentionality that comes with um, placement of grocery stores and restaurants, um, were part of Netia's focus on food sovereignty. Netia's founding executive director, Devora, explained this focus to me as we sat in a shady corner of the parking lot later that morning. She said, the work that Netia is involved with is in shifting food work that happens inside our communities 
from the food relief paradigm to one that's not charitable focused, but justice driven. The micro grant program allowed Netia to enact a model of food justice focused on helping people in the community use their own land to grow food they want to grow in areas where fresh and affordable produce is harder to acquire. That morning, the plan was to uh, turn a lot covered in dried grass and stones into a garden, which you can see here. After Anthony and Devorah welcomed us into the circle, we split into groups and started building a garden. I spent the next two hours taking apart wood pallets with a group of teens so they could use the wood to build raised beds. Another group spread topsoil over the dried grass to make the land level. And a final group worked with a man named Nate, who was the garden's designer, um, who worked at Westside Urban Gardens. And he was measuring and marking the sections of the proposed garden space. These community micro grants and community garden installations were just part of the work that Netia did in LA. 15 sustainable gardens comprised Netia's Just Gardens program that was focused on reconnecting Jewish residents of LA County to the land. Netia also hosted an annual food, faith, and field symposium, which gathered lay leaders, clergy, gardeners, educators, and cooks from faith and spiritual communities to explore stewardship. All of the work that Netia did in the years that it ran in LA brought religious people from various backgrounds together to foster self-reliance and stewardship in ways that were meaningful and necessary for residents of Los Angeles. So even though Netia is no longer in operation, gardens and farms that they helped start are still growing food all over LA. A short drive up the coast from LA took me to the Malibu Hills, where I visited the Shalom Institute, which was then home to Shemesh Organic Farm. Shemesh Organic Farm provides an educational space for campers at Camp JCA Shalom, as well as retreat centers from all over California year round. It is also home to Shemesh Enterprises, a program designed to empower young adults with different abilities through employment, internships, and social connections. The Shemesh Farm Fellows, most of whom are not Jewish, work on the farm to grow and harvest herbs and other products, and then they sell these products at the Shemesh Farm Stand and at other farmers markets around Malibu. So that afternoon, I helped Davis, the farm director, and four farm fellows with a planting project on the farm. It took our group about an hour to plant two trees. The fellows chose a Buddha's hand tree and an orange tree, and we set to work. The fellows rotated between digging large holes, clearing rocks, and covering tree roots with soil and a layer of straw as we set them into the ground. When the trees were settled into their new home, another fellow watered them in. This process involved a lot of hands-on instruction and assistance from Davis and the staff that, is, that come with the farm fellows to assist them. A group of young campers working nearby finished planting their tree before we finished digging our first hole. When I sat down with Davis later, he explained that the program's goals are not related to productivity. The program was designed specifically to provide employment for differently abled young adults. Davis reflected, they can do so much more than we thought. We've seen growth from verbal growth to work growth or focus growth. It's powerful. Davis estimated that about 85% of the differently abled population in the area is unemployed. So he was happy that Shemesh was able to provide these jobs. But he also noted that there's more than that happening there. They're creating community. The mornings that I spent with the farm fellows made it clear that that's exactly what's happening. They bonded with each other and with the staff at the Shalom Institute. They usually arrive excited and ready to work and often didn't wanna leave when it was time to go. Bill, who's the executive director of the Shalom Institute, taught a class on biblical foods for the farm fellows one morning. And when he asked one of the farm fellows what they think about being at Shemesh, the fellow replied, it's like paradise here. At Shemesh Organic Farm, again, productivity is not the goal. Instead, the farm is utilized as a space for education and empowerment of Jewish and non-Jewish people of all ages, religions, and abilities. The Shemesh organic farm that I visited in 2015 was destroyed by the Woolsey wildfire in 2018. 
The Shemesh Enterprises program has been rehoused at the Malibu Jewish Center and synagogue where it remains today. Since I began this research, many of the Jewish community farming organizations have changed missions, changed shape, and closed or reopened. The field is flexible and amenable to change, and that's often due to their close relationship to the land and to the people in their cities and spaces. As the needs of the communities change, as their environment changes, the Jewish community farming organizations are responding and reimagining what the Jewish community will need in the coming years. So North American Jews um, can obviously study Jewish texts and traditions around agriculture and embrace Jewish environmental values in their homes and in their synagogues and in their schools. Um, but these Jewish community farming organizations enable what I would argue is a deeper level of connection. These Jewish farms bring together Jewish agricultural laws, holidays, and values, and create spaces that are defined, defined specifically by a Jewish ecological ethic. These spaces allow Jews who may not be aware of the role of agriculture in Judaism to experience Judaism on a different level. In a conversation with Risa and Sabrina from Shoresh, they reflected on the relief that they felt when they each realized that their commitments to Judaism and the environment were related. Sabrina described it as a healing moment when she realized that these two worlds did not have to be separate. She recalled a moment of integration and realizing that they could have both. She was grateful for her job at Shorish because it offered the opportunity to actually live Judaism, which she felt she had not been able to do before. Risa similarly, similarly recalled a radical aha moment where she connected these pieces as well. And she said, not only do these things go together, but to bridge these two worlds of Jewish tradition and environmental sustainability, they just strengthen each other in such deep and profound ways. Jewish community farming organizations like Shorish and the others I've discussed or shown images of make living out Jewish ecological ethics based on biblical texts and ancient traditions both practical and possible. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>